So my name is Omotola and I'm a second year PhD student in the HRM program. And I'm happy to share this study where I looked at the cost effectiveness of emicizumab for the prevention of bleeds in a specified population of patients with hemophilia A. So I work on this as my independent study project, which is part of the comprehensive exam. And I worked with Dr. Jenner Reek supervising the project. Dr. Feng was the member at large. Dr. God helped to verify our sensitivity analysis. And Dr. Davide and Dr. Alfonso provided clinical guidance. Um, I'm trying to move through my slides. Um, okay. So I'll be covering these key points where I'll be going over the background, looking at the treatment landscape for hemophilia A and the role of emicizumab for the prevention of bleeds. Our study objective, which is estimating incremental cost per quality adjusted life years, the use of Markov model and our key findings and recommendations. Sorry. So for a background, hemophilia A, is a rare X chromosome linked bleeding disorder where there's a deficiency of blood clotting factor eight resulting in excessive bleeding after bruising or trauma. And symptoms depend on the severity of this deficiency. For instance, in mild and moderate disease, there is excessive bleeding after bruising or surgery. But in severe cases, patients could experience spontaneous bleeding into joints, muscles or soft tissue, even in the absence of trauma. So due to bleeding into joints and other tissues, complications usually include joint damage, which requires joint replacement surgeries and long-term disability. So hemophilia affects mostly men with an estimated one in 10,000 live male births and a little over 1 million men affected worldwide. In Canada, we have about 3,000 males with hemophilia A. Now, the standard of care is to prevent bleeds from happening in the first place or by treat, treating them when they happen by using clotting factor replacements, which could be plasma derived or genetically engineered. A major complication, treatment related complication is the development of inhibitors or antibodies. And this is a problem in five to 7% of patients leading to the use of another class of drugs called bypassing agents. In Canada, there are about 150 to 200 patients with inhibitors. Now, emicizumab is a bispecific monoclonal antibody which mimics endogenous factor eight. It was reported as a breakthrough discovery in 2017 with improved clinical and patient reported outcomes. However, the economic outcomes are not encouraged its use in all patient populations. So a literature review of the cost effectiveness in patients with inhibitors showed that over a patient's lifetime, using a societal perspective in the United States, about 70 million US dollars is saved per patient and 0.2 quality adjusted life years gained with emicizumab prophylaxis compared to clotting factor prophylaxis. This is also consistent with studies conducted in France, Italy and in Canada. Now, based on this, emicizumab is approved and reimbursed for use in about the 100 patients with inhibitors in Canada. Now, in patients without inhibitors, a study in the US showed that emicizumab is not cost effective. It costs an additional $2 million per patient for a very minimal difference in quality adjusted life years. In Canada, assessment done by CADID used um, the manufacturer submission suggests that emicizumab is cost saving. However, the model used does not depict the real world disease progression. So based on this, the decision problem is there is no reimbursement of emicizumab use in patients without inhibitors due to the lack of cost effectiveness data. So this is the health approval and reimbursement timelines in Canada and the US. And the bottom line is that emicizumab is not approved, is not reimbursed, is approved in the non-inhibitor population. 
So our study objective is to answer the question, in patients with hemophilia A without inhibitors, what is the incremental cost per quality associated with emicizumab prophylaxis compared to chlorine factor prophylaxis from a Canadian public payer perspective? And we assess this using established guidelines and the chair's checklist. We also looked at other clinically meaningful endpoints in hemophilia, such as annual number of bleeds, total annual cost, and total cost over a lifetime horizon. So here is a summary of the key steps and considerations for our study. And I'll be providing more details in following slides. We use the Markov model as opposed to a simple decision tree due to the chronic nature of hemophilia, where we have repetitive and sequential outcomes. There's a two-way progression between health states and because we also have to model long-term outcomes. And we have a model comprising of four health states. And patients were modeled to be in the state for one week and were followed for a lifetime. Uh, our analysis was from a Canadian public payer perspective. And this means cost estimates include not only direct medical cost, but also potential costs due to productivity losses, for example. So the Markov model makes some assumptions. For example, it assumes that transition probabilities are constant over time, and this is not realistic. So to address this, we use time-dependent probabilities, which is based on the number of cycles or number of times a patient has moved through the model. Another assumption is that the probability of a patient making a particular transition is independent of where the patient came from in the model. That is the memory-less uh, assumption of the Markov model. And we address this by using tunnel states and also in our simulation. So here is what our model looks like. The four health states were without target joints, with target joints, with do joint damage, and dead. So a target joint is defined as a joint with two or three bleeds within a six month period. So 1000 patients with severe disease aged 33, 36 years were model. And this was based on the characteristics of the uh, pivotal randomized control trial for this population. So for starting probabilities, patients enter the model in a state of no bleeding distributed between two states and cost and utilities were associated to each state and uh, qualities. So, so the expected cost and qualities over a lifetime horizon were derived at using Markov chain simulations and we calculated incremental cost utility ratio, ratio if a patient is on emicizumab or if a patient is on chlorine factor replacement therapy. So additional analysis apart from the ISO that we got, we, um, we, we discounted cost and utilities beyond the first year at the rate of 1.5% uh, 1, 1 per year. And drug cost for emicizuma was not publicly available in Canada. So we obtained these figures from, U, from the US cost using the, the appropriate foreign exchange rates. We did scenario analysis over two years, five years, 10 years, and 20 year time horizon to check for consistency of our study results across this time horizons. We estimated uncertainty using probabilistic sensitivity analysis and presented our results in cost effectiveness acceptability curve. And we, we modeled this and analyzed using Microsoft Excel. We also made some other study assumptions based on the natural progression of the disease, we assumed that bleeds were resolved in 100% of bleeding episodes. And we made assumptions regarding um, joint damage and joint replacement um, surgery that patients cannot go back to the state of no joints, no target joints or no arthropathy once arthropathy has happened. We also estimated that um, new joint damage will happen every 20 years and follow up will be required after another 20 years. So this is a summary of our finding. We found that 
annual number of bleeds reduced by 33% in patients on emicizumab prophylaxis compared to chlorine factors. Additional 0.9 quality adjusted live years was gained on emicizumab prophylaxis. An annual average annual cost saving per patient was 55,000 Canadian dollars per year. And cost saving per patient over the lifetime was 3.5 million Canadian dollars over the lifetime horizon. And we found then that um, the incremental cost per quality is $3.9 million per quality. Okay, so this is the result of our scenario analysis. And we see that emicisma prophylaxis is consistently dominant across the different time horizons that we looked at. In the first year, there was no change in quality, but this changed from the second year with emicizumab improving quality and costs were also consistently lower for emicizumab due to reduced treatment of bleeds and no development of new joint damage. In our probabilistic sensitivity analysis, our result too was um, consistent to say that uh, emicizumab prophylaxis was dominant over clothing factor prophylaxis. And when plotted against a um, maximum net to pay, the probability that emicidal problem is cost effective is 100% at any willingness to pay threshold. So in conclusion, we saw that over a lifetime horizon, bleed pre prevention with emicidal is a dominant strategy. And we, we can save $3.9 million for every quality adjusted life year gained. We had a reduction in annualized bleeding rates and we prevented new joint damage due to um, emicizumab prophylaxis. And our studies are consistent when model parameters were varied in sensitivity analysis. And this strategy is cost effective, cost effective at any willingness to pay threshold. We recommend based on our findings that Emicizumab prophylaxis should be reimbursed in Canadian patients with hemophilia A. However, the budget impact should be carefully assessed due to the high variability in cost and effect estimates. So that was all I have, just the limitations and the strengths, but that is everything I have. Thank you.